Uh, I'm excited you guys are here. It's Baptism Sunday. We've baptized, oh, math, hold on, 39 people today, which is really cool. I already told you that. I already told you that, but some of you guys were a little late and you didn't hear that. So uh, we're, we're excited. Hopefully we can baptize uh, 39 more, everybody in this room. It'll be awesome. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to have that opportunity. But before we get into the word, let's pray and thank the Lord for the tithe and offering. Join me. Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for your provision, Lord, in, in our in our lives, both on a, on a little microcosmic level, but also as a church, also as a, a, a community and a nation, Lord, you, Lord, you've provided so much more than we deserve. Lord, we might look at our financial situation and, and feel like we're in need, but really, um, we don't deserve any of it, any of it, Lord. So, so it's, all, it's all grace, and we want to use it all to glorify your name. Lord, as a church, Lord, as a family, uh, we lay it all at your feet. We thank you for being so generous to us and, and allowing us to participate in that generosity too, Lord. We, we give it all back to you in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, fun time leading worship with you guys. This is third service. I got everything I have left in the tank, I give to you, okay? I, 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 we're, I give it to you. I'm just, that's all I got. So if it's not enough, I'm sorry. That's all I got. I, you can't ask for any more than that. Um, so we're, hopefully there's some, there's some people here that already plan on getting baptized, but maybe, like I said in the introduction before we started, uh, maybe you think you're, you're pretty sure you're not getting baptized, but hopefully um, the Lord changes your heart. This is obedience. Obedience, baptism. Repent, be baptized. It's a commandment. Not, it doesn't say that if you, you're not baptized, you're condemned, but, but we are commanded to get baptized. Uh, somehow baptism is part of being saved, but it's not part of being, con- it, but not being baptized isn't part of being condemned. It's, it's crazy. I don't know how God works that. It's a sacrament. It's part, of, it's part of our process in being a Christian is getting baptized. It's getting baptized. You're not condemned if you don't, but he says to do it. So uh, if now you might just feel guilted into doing it. <laughs> but but I, I'm really excited. We don't have signups or anything. So if, if the Lord puts it on your heart, you just, just go for it. You'll have that opportunity. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians today, uh, the second book um, in, in this, this two-part series, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. If you guys need a Bible, you can raise your hand, and our usher, ushers will get you a Bible. Just raise your hand. If you don't have a Bible at all, you can keep this Bible, um, and, and it's yours. It's our gift to you, as long as you promise to read it. Read it. So, we're in 2 Corinthians. We just finished 1 Corinthians. Does anybody remember what the sermon was titled last week? What, what did we talk about last week? Love, yes, a more excellent way, right? And it was going um, from 1 Corinthians, Paul talking about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and then going into the chapter of love. Remember, we got our spiritual suntan from the chapter of love, and it was this, this amazing depiction of love being the most important of it all. Love's preeminence in all of the gifts. Remember, I, I, I was hitting the symbols, uh, the crash symbol, the loudest symbol that we have. I was hitting it. And that's what Paul says, your tongues sound like without love. Your beautiful gift of the tongues of, beautiful tongues of men and tongues of angels is like a clanging symbol and brass. Just annoying. Nobody wants to hear it without love. And so this is, this is of, of paramount importance. Kind of seems, um, kind of seems a little elementary. And this is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians are these, kind of these basic concepts, but we're moving out of 1 Corinthians into 2 Corinthians. And if you were with us last year, I kind of nerded out a little bit about this, that the book of 2 Corinthians isn't actually the second letter to the church at Corinth. It's the second uh, canonized letter to the, the church at Corinth. So, so we have 1 Corinthians, labeled 1 Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about a letter before. So clearly, 1 Corinthians isn't the first letter. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul also talks about another letter that came before. That wasn't 1 Corinthians. So we know that there's at least three letters before this book, 2 Corinthians. Why does it matter? I think what's cool about it is that out of all of the letters, surely this is not all of the letters that, that, that was written by the apostles. But out of all of them, this is what God saw fit to ordain as canonized scripture. That means that there's nothing in here that's an accident. Everything is specifically designed here, not, not written about us, but it's to us, it's for us to glean from. And this is, this is 2 Corinthians. And, and we're, we're gonna jump in as we see this progression of, uh, of the tenets of the faith as 1 Corinthians deals with 
you know, 1 Corinthians is dealing with some very elementary issues. And the, the church of Corinth is believed to have received them the most amount of letters than any other church. Why? Because they needed help so desperately. Can anybody relate to that? Does anybody in here need help? Okay, praise the Lord. If, your hand, if you don't think you need help, then you need extra help. That, you need that much more help, okay? And, and they needed help. They really did. They really did. They, 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 they were struggling. They were struggling. They, you would think that, that they would have some of these concepts down already, but they really needed, uh, they needed Paul to encourage them. They, they needed um, to, to progress. And I'm seeing that in my own life as I'm studying through God's word. I, I'm, I'm seeing a progression. I'm seeing God teaching me brand new things every single time I open the scriptures. I am forced. I have to. I have to study my Bible at least enough to do this with you guys every week. That's huge. That's a lot of studying. That's a lot of God's word. You're not, you maybe aren't forced to do that. That's why uh, Pastor Rob says, I'm not behind this, this pulpit because I'm the best of you. I'm behind the pulpit because I, I need the most accountability. I need you guys to hold me accountable to be studying the word. And as you study the word, you mature. We're not abandoning the elementary things of God like love, but we're building upon these precepts. I'm, I'm noticing it in my own heart. And just like the, the fruit and, and the progression is evident in my own life. It was evident in the church at Corinth. Because remember back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what does Paul say? I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And actually, I take it back. Even now you are still not able he was holding back a little bit. He wants to talk about some things, but the congregants, they weren't quite ready yet. They're not quite as spiritually mature as you guys. It's taking them a little bit longer. But we see this. In 1 Corinthians, focused on very practical behavioral Christian things, very practical church issues, stuff that every Christian needs to know. Like, hey, let's not get drunk at the communion table. Seems like that's pretty, pretty standard. You guys aren't even able to get drunk. Do you know how much grape juice you'd have to drink to get drunk? You'd die before you got drunk. But they were, they were literally using communion as an opportunity to get wasted with their friends. Paul's like, hey, look, that's probably not a good idea. Hey, let, let's not participate in demonic uh, prostitution worship services in the temple of Aphrodite. Let, maybe we should not do that as Christians. Very basic stuff. Let's flee from idolatry. Let's flee from sexual immorality. Basic stuff. Some of you guys haven't been following along, and so you... you you might think that's crazy. There's no way. Like that, these are actual things that they were struggling with. The church at Corinth made California look like a nunnery. Like made California look like, <laughs> like a like a like a monastery. Seriously, they were jacked up. But now we see, as we open Second Corinthians, a progression into deeper theological ideas, into deeper concepts. In the first chapter, Paul he talks about the comfort of God in the midst of all the suffering and the affliction. How, how the, the affliction that we're going through is God gives us comfort, that comfort that God gives us. He doesn't give it to us just for us. He gives it so that when everybody around us also goes through that affliction, that we can use the comfort that God comforted us with to comfort them. In chapter two, Paul talks and instructs on this un un unendingly important concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Uh, and Garrett talked about how we're going to have a, a conference, a, a women's conference about forgiveness, the forgiveness conference. So important. We, we can't overlook this. If you're not forgiving, what are you doing? Seriously. Forgiveness. This is the heart of Jesus. We are to forgive. Forgiveness in the church. And, and Paul talks about it's so, so, so important. The heart of Jesus to receive forgiveness, to repent and receive forgiveness when we mess up. And when we require, require discipline, but then also to extend forgiveness to those who, who needed discipline, but just like Jesus forgave us, he didn't hold the sin against us. He forgave us in our repentance and restored us. And that's what Paul's talking about. He talks about discipline, not unto punishment. That's not the purpose of church discipline. It isn't to punish you for doing what's wrong. It's to discipline you, discipleship, to grow us through, make us more like Jesus. These are the more mature concepts that the church in Corinth, they're, they're moving on to. In the end of chapter two, Paul transitions, transitions into this really cool focus on the, the triumphal nature of our life as believers, our Christian ministry. 
the triumph that we have in Christ. And he gives this really cool picture, and everybody at the, at the time would understand this. We have to read into it to get it, but he talks about how, how this Christian life that we have is like a Roman victory parade, like a, military, a Roman military victory parade. Second Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Such a cool picture. The diffusers of God's knowledge. You guys know, you guys have essential oils. You guys probably have diffusers all over your house. Diffusing, that's me, that's my family. Diffusing, not essential oils, God's knowledge. What a noble calling. And back then, they would have these parades that for the Roman generals, when they would win, they would be triumph, triumphant and, and victorious in battle, and it was so glorious. Over the top, the spectacle the most over-the-top thing that they, would, uh, that they would observe at the time, the officer, officers marching in the streets, then parading the spoils of war, leading the prisoners of war, musicians, music. They'd have priests swinging the censers of incense, the sweet-smelling incense, burning. And finally, the general himself. And that incense was there because our olfactory sense, our nose, the, a smelling, it, it allows us to remember things most accurately. We tie our memories to smells. That's why you can smell the cologne that your boyfriend wore 25 years ago, and it brings you back to that moment. It's our smell. And that's what they were using this incense for that, so that you would be reminded. You would be reminded of how victorious this general was. How victorious, and that's what that's what Paul is saying that we are like. This isn't my sermon. It's just so cool. I couldn't pass it up. That, <laughs> this is just context. This is the, the picture that Paul is giving us, that Christ leads us in triumphant, uh, a triumphant parade. And the body of Christ, we're diffusing the fragrance that is his knowledge and the gospel in every place, declaring the victory of God Almighty, that the world would know, that his allies would be comforted and his enemies would be, would be afraid. This, this incense, that's us, the diffusers of the knowledge of God. I love, love that picture. And just as we're diffusing the knowledge of God as incense, we're also, as he goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we're the diffusing the knowledge of God, but we're also living epistles that God is writing on our hearts. A testimony, not with ink, but with the Holy Spirit. This is at the beginning of chapter 3. Living epistles, letters written by Christ, 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, clearly you're an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Amazing picture of the transformative power of God. In our lives, to take such a, a broken thing like my heart and to use my heart as a letter, to be his letter, that he's trying to communicate to other people, he's using you to communicate his heart to other people. It's amazing. A, a glorious calling. Broken humans. Chosen by God to diffuse the beautiful fragrance of his knowledge to the world. He doesn't have to use us, but he chooses to use us. I love this illustration. I come back to it all the time about my kids. It's not easier for me to have my kids help me do things. It's more difficult for me. It's more difficult to have my two-year-old help me do things. It's more difficult to have my five-year-old, but, but I choose to have them help me. I choose to, to make it take a little bit longer, that I might be able to have joy in my children participating in my kingdom. That's how God looks at us. He's like, I don't care. I could do, I could snap and it would be done. But I want, I want, to, I want to see my kids work it out, figure it out. The test, my living testimonies, we're letters Letters of Christ, carrying the very presence of God. This is the, co the new covenant that Paul talks about in the remainder of chapter 3. This is our, our, this is our recap. Remainder of chapter 3, he's talking about how we're not, no longer uh, looking at the law written on stone tablets for salvation, but God actually transforms us under the law of grace to be walking vessels of righteousness, filled with the Holy Spirit. His temple, the dwelling place of God. We carry with us the very presence of the living God, the light of Christ, the gospel of Christ. And it says right before our verse that we're going to be studying today in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give 
the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. I'm going to say that a lot today. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He has placed in our hearts the light, the light, illuminating light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Remember, darkness isn't a thing. Darkness doesn't, isn't something, a tangible thing that exists. What is darkness? It's the absence of light. When light isn't there, then there is darkness. We can, what is darkness? If you use any word to explain it, 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 what is nothing? Nothing. Well, n- nothing is, it's nothing. That, it's, that's what, what the world is without light. It is darkness. Cold is not a thing. Cold is just the absence of energy, the absence of heat. Darkness is not light's evil equal. It's the absence of it. This is, this is your heart without Jesus. Your heart without Jesus. You might say, oh, I'm not evil. I'm not an evil person. I just don't, I just don't love Jesus. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to be evil is not to know Jesus, to not have that illuminating light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And for the Christian, the God who literally spoke light, illuminating the, the, the darkness of the physical world, did the same thing spiritually to you, regenerated your heart. Once dark, void of Christ, he illuminated, imparted to you the knowledge of the glory of God. How did he do that? How could you possibly have the knowledge of the glory of God by the face of Jesus Christ? Through Jesus. That's how he did it. He put it there. He put that treasure there. And you would think that that he would put that treasure, something of such invaluable importance, you would think he'd put it in a perfectly secure, unbreakable, pelican case, glorious, ornate vessel. But no, he puts the treasure in us. These broken, frail humans or as Paul refers to us in our passage today, jars of clay, earthen vessels. He put that treasure, the, that God would put such a precious gift inside, such a frail container. This is the wonder of his grace in the life of a believer. He chooses to use the broken hearts, to, 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 to use as his, his letters, his epistles, the broken feet, our, our, our broken, dirty, gross feet to carry out diffusing incense of the gospel the foolish things, the foolish unfinished vessels to carry out his perfect plans. And the beautiful truth that we're going to be studying today, this idea that the more frail, the more frail and the more weak the vessel, the more frail and the more weak that the vessel is, the more that its contents are revealed. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Treasure in jars of clay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. We're only going to cover a few verses because we got to get to dunking people. Uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you guys to stand up. 2 Corinthians 4, we're going to start at verse 7. Are you ready? Look, if I leave it all in the field, you got to leave it all in the field, okay? If I'm going to go, go, go there, you got to go there. Turn your brain on. We're going. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Take a seat. So I have in here, I have in my notes all the way through verse 18. I, I kept pu- peeling it back a little bit. I was like, I'm going to go through verse 18. And I was like, eh, I'm going to go to verse 16. No, we'll go to 15. I was like, okay, let's do 11. We'll just, we'll try to do four verses and get through it. I think that's four, five maybe. And as we're, like I said, we're going to be saying this a lot. There's so much in this. It's so much in this. I, just, I almost don't even need to teach about it because it's so good. Treasure in earthen vessels. The most important thing to understand, not necessarily we'll talk about the earthen vessel, but what's important to understand is what the treasure is. We need to continually come back to what that treasure is that Paul's talking about. What's the treasure? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Do not lose sight of this. Many things that the tre- treasure is not, but what it is, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What does that mean? What does it mean? It's kind of confusing. It's it's the unavoidable illuminating reaction 
that we have in our hearts to knowing God through the work of Christ on the cross. That's what it is. The, the question that men and women have been asking since the beginning of time, who am, what is my purpose? Is there a God? Can I know him? In the face of Jesus Christ, we have been given the answer to this, this great question. There is no greater treasure in life than to have your heart illuminated by the knowledge of the glory of God through Christ Jesus. It's indisputably the most valuable thing that exists as it relates to the human experience. For our hearts to be illuminated. And herein lies the contrast that such a treasure, such a gift has been placed in such a common vessel. A jar of clay. Some of you might be saying, well, I've seen, you know, really beautiful jars of clay. The light of the, the knowledge of the glory of God. I've seen really, really beautiful jars of clay. No, no, no. This is just a clay pot, just a normal clay pot. I try to find the most generic picture of just a pile of clay pots that, clay pots that I could possibly find. Could there be a more common vessel? Could there be a, 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 less, a, a, a less impressive thing? Just a clay pot. And not only is it just a clay pot, what Paul says here, the, the word that he uses, earthen vessel, this word for earthen, not just any old pot, it's with an added suggestion of frailty. You're not just a boring old pot, you are a frail, boring old pot. Uh, this is a description that I can, I can really identify with. And as clear as the picture is for us, it, it's infinitely more clear for them back then. In, in ancient Middle East, this, this pottery was an essential part of every single day. Dude, you don't have to take your baby out, trust me. It actually it helps me think. <laughs> I'm like, that's normal. The silence, not normal. <laughs> but but it, was, it was even, it, it, back in, ancient, in the, the ancient Middle East, they used these, this pottery for everything. They used it to store water, to store oil, grain, wine. They used it for cooking, serving food. And despite how important it was, how, how, how utilitarian the pot was, it was looked at as disposable because they used it so often. And clay is not known for its structural integrity as it pertains to pottery. And it was so common because they needed so much of it, they made it so quickly that, that it became even more fragile as they were, just, they were just pumping out clay pots, clay pots, clay pots. They were often cracked. They were often broken and typically discarded. And this is where God places his treasure. In this broken pot, this broken pot, this is the great contrast. It's a universal experience in Christendom. You've experienced this by design that in the most broken and fragile people, you can see Christ most clearly. In the most broken and fragile people, that's where you see the illumination of Christ clearly. There's nowhere to hide. He reduces us down to a minimum that he may pour in his maximum. And I get this all the time where people come up to me and they're, they're, so, they're so grieved by their, their circumstance. They're so grieved by how broken they are. They're so grieved by the, the broken situation that their spouse may be in. Maybe they have a child and their child is straying away from the Lord. And they want to rescue them out of the brokenness. And they want to rescue them out of the despair. They want to rescue them out of of the frailty of life. But remember your own life. I remember mine before Christ. God was so faithful to strip away all the adornments, all of the, the support systems to expose to myself just how much I needed him, just how frail of a vessel I was. Maybe that's you right now. That I thought it was this big shot and all of my external support systems holding up this, this poor old frail pot, they're crumbling away and I'm realizing that I'm not that great and I'm just one more moderately intense event away from being a pile of pot shards. And God doesn't say, oh, it's okay, get back up and try again, you little, you little frail pot. Let's, let's just slap some plaster on you and let's see if you can do it again. Let's fortify these things around your life that are supporting you. Let's, just, let's build up your, your, your nest egg a little bit more. Let's, let's improve. It's a little self-improvement and let's push you back out there. No. You're broken and God says, good, finally. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for all of those external things to disappear. It's by design, by design that you would discover just how weak you are. 
Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit, this humility. Why does God choose to do it this way? Why wouldn't he place his treasure in a worthy, secure vessel that could match his power and magnificence? You would think, you would think that it would just add to it, right? Well, you have an amazing treasure, put it in an amazing pot, and then it's even more amazing. No, God doesn't need your help. He does it this way on purpose, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. That's the point. So that one can look upon the life of a believer and contribute anything good, anything good, not to the vessel, but only to the power of God. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. He's a jealous God. The glory is only his. God doesn't share his praise and his glory. A beautiful pot just takes away from the glory that only belongs to him. He doesn't want that. And because of that, our job is not just to absorb the glory. I'm just absorbing all the glory of God and then I just kind of give it back to God in a little prayer at nighttime. I just, oh, th- thank you, thank you so much. I know, I tried really hard. I tried really hard. I'm just like, all to Jesus, all to, all to God. No, the point is, the point of Christianity, the point of it is not just to absorb it and give it back to God. It's to be so transparent that nobody even sees you. Nobody even sees your adornment. So transparent, to be perfectly transparent vessels. This is the difference between true Christianity and man-made religion. What we're studying here, true Christianity says, be a transparent vessel so that others may see Christ in you, clearly. The religion of man says, let's decorate and adorn the vessel as much as we possibly can so that those around you see you as worthy of containing the light of the knowledge of God. Let me adorn the vessels as much as I possibly can so that God, as he's searching for beautiful vessels, would go, you know what, that one's beautiful enough. Let me put the treasure in that one. No, 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 he's not looking for a beautiful vessel. He's looking for a transparent one. One that when he puts the treasure in it will be seen clearly for everyone around him. It's not about the vessel. The point is that others would look and see the glory of God without anything in the way. And know, know that he is the source of all things good. The more frail the vessel, the more clearly Christ is seen. This goes, it goes against our nature. We desire credit. We desire to take credit for the good things that are happening around us. We desire glory in our own flesh. It reminds me of, of Jesus' rebuke to the church at Laodicea. Who, they had everything. At least they thought they did. They thought that their, their, their vessels in the church, they were so beautiful on the outside, but what did, what did he say? They're, decor- they're decorated, adorned, glorified. But Jesus says, because you say, I am rich, have become, become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Naked. My parents are here. My dad, he says that like that. Naked. <laughs> This is, this is the reality. We think we're adorned. We think we're beautiful, but really we're, we're miserable on the inside. The contents of the pot, miserable. Our flesh, flesh says, let me be as strong as I possibly can so that I might be able to contribute in some way to the glory that is God's. What Paul says later in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, God is talking. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You, you, are, you are strong. When you are strong, you can glorify God. It's possible. But it's in our weakness that he is most glorified. The power of Christ rests upon not the worthy, but the weak. The power of Christ rests upon not the propped up and successful, but the persecuted. The power of Christ rests upon not the filled, but the emptied. The power of Christ rests upon not the victorious, but the surrendered. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. 
that there might be room enough for him in our hearts. In order for there be, to be enough room, it needs to be completely empty. And when the treasure is deposited into this jar of clay, as we receive that, we receive that treasure as it's deposited. It's like receiving a holy fortification. We've gone through our lives trying to fortify from the outside to hold up this, this broken body, this broken life, this broken vessel, trying to, to, to vacuum pack, packing peanuts around this, this incredibly fragile pot. But when we receive this holy fortification, what was once just a common piece of pottery, it now becomes unbreakable, not because of the vessel, but because of the contents inside of it. People look at you and they go, how is that, that broken person? Any normal common earthen vessel would, would be absolutely pulverized by the weight of what's happening right now. What's different about you? This is your testimony. It has nothing to do with you. That's why the more beat up and broken you are in the world's eyes, the easier preaching the gospel becomes. You notice that. You notice that. The most, the most down and out people, it becomes the, the easiest to talk about Jesus. I got nothing to lose. I got nothing to lose. And as soon as you start adorning the vessel, suddenly you're like, eh, this, this vessel's pretty cool, actually. All of a sudden, the light can't be seen as clearly. Fortified from within, because he has placed the most glorious treasure inside of my heart, nothing can stop me. I'm immortal until God decides differently. We are hard-pressed on every side. This is so encouraging for us, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Some of you guys may have seen this experiment. Maybe you've done this experiment. If you haven't, maybe you want to do it at home with your kids or your grandkids or maybe you're just an adult and you want to do a science experiment in your kitchen. That's totally fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. And it's this experiment where you take a balloon and you fill the balloon up with air. You just blow normal air into the balloon. And you hold a flame up to it. And what happens? The balloon pops. Almost instantly, the balloon pops. But you fill that same type of balloon. Nothing changes. Vessel doesn't change. That same type of balloon up with what? Water. You hold that same flame up to it. What happens? Nothing. The balloon can't pop. The balloon won't pop. Why? Not because the, the, the rubber changed. It's the same frail rubber. It's the contents of the balloon that has changed. Water, it has a high specific heat capacity. You don't believe me. Try it at home. It can absorb all of the heat without a significant change in temperature. So when the flame is applied to a water-filled balloon, the water inside absorbs much of the heat, distributing it away from the surface of the balloon. And since the water absorbs the heat, the rubber of the balloon doesn't get hot enough to weaken or break, allowing the balloon to stay intact even when exposed to the flame. Same fragile, non-heat-resistant balloon, different contents. When God illuminates the darkness of one's heart, suddenly and miraculously the fire touches but does not burn. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3.25, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. There was another in the fire standing next to me as we were crying. That's the point. That's what this happens. That's what happens when, when, you, when you have the light, the illuminating light of the knowledge of God in your heart. The flame has no power over you and God doesn't remove you from the circumstance. He doesn't take you out of the fire. Bummer. But like Paul, we rejoice in it. He gives you a supernatural ability to withstand it. The knowledge of the glory of God through Christ Jesus is to the believer the holy fortification of the earthen vessel. We're hard pressed on every side, yet not cursed. The pressing of the world no longer has power to crush you. No longer. The contents of your heart will not allow you to be compressed beyond repair. Act like it. Because the, the jar of clay seems so out of place in the pressing, God alone is glorified. People look at you. Like I said before, they go, what? How is that possible? How is that possible? Only through the power of Jesus. Perplexed, but not in despair. There are innumerable perplexities, but not a single one is justification for the believer to have despair. The knowledge of the, the world leads to more questioning, 
more confusion, ultimately despair. I give up, but the light of the knowledge of the glory of God brings all peace. There are many questions unanswered, but I cannot despair because I have the answer to the only question that really matters. It's how, how must I be saved? I got that. What a glorious treasure. What other questions you got? Not important. I, I don't know a lot. I don't know what's going to happen in November. I, got, I, have, I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm going to afford to continue to live in California with six children. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm perplexed. I don't know how I'm going to be able to prepare a sermon every single week for the foreseeable future. I don't know. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know why, why some of our mo- most beloved servants here at church are sick and why some of them have gone to be with the Lord. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The perplexities are unending. But the, but the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ allows me to look at it all, all of the unanswered questions and not despair. The word for despair is to be utterly at a loss, utterly destitute of measures or resources to renounce all hope. We are never destitute of resources. Our, our Savior, our God, owns a cattle on a billion hills. There, there's nothing, there's nothing that he does not have. There's nothing he doesn't have. Therefore, our resources, no matter what it looks like, we are never destitute, never. We, we never renounce all hope. I won't renounce all hope because my hope is eternal in the heavens. And when, you, when you're pressed and you're not crushed and when you're perplexed, but you don't give up all hope, the enemy, man, he hates to see it. He hates to see that. He hates it. He wants you crushed. He wants you to be crushed. And when he he can't do it, it makes him mad. He wants you to to despair, but when you can't do it, it makes him angry. He's trying to figure out how he can get you, and when he can, he's like, man. He sees the fragile vessels withstanding the most brutal circumstances, knowing that it's because it's their contents. I can't get to the thing that's aiding them. There's nothing I can do about that one. The other people, I can, I can work at the external fortifications. I can work at those things. But the internal ones, man, so what do I do? What does the enemy do? Persecute. Persecute. Specific and direct persecution. Just shut the Christians up. Just, just physically make them be quiet. But even in that, we're persecuted but not forsaken. Even in that, we're struck down but not destroyed. Forsaken, it means to be abandoned. Those of you here who are being persecuted for the sake of Jesus, let, rem- let me remind you that God is with you. He is with you. The enemy wants you to believe the lie that you've been forsaken, but you have not. You have not been forsaken. God is closer to you. God is close to those who are for- God wants. God wants to be with you. That's where, you're, that's where your identif- identity with Christ lies, in the persecution. Matthew 28, 20 says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is a promise. Myself and God constitute a majority. I love that. The majority is not, they're going to be everybody in the world, and it's me and God, and we win every single time. Romans 8, 31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You are not alone. Though none go with me, still I will follow. He won't abandon you. He cannot. He's promised it. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. The persecution of the enemy, it serves as an opportunity for us to be emptied even further of ourselves. All the more that Christ might be revealed more in us. And ultimately, if it's unto to giving up our life here on earth, to martyrdom, God should see fit that we would die for the faith. It's still not being forsaken. It's still, it's still not unto, unto absolute disparity. No. It's to, to be ultimately graduated. It's graduation day. To go from the light of the knowledge of glory of God in our heart to face to face with face to face with Jesus in heaven. The, the whole passage reminds me of Polycarp of Smyrna. Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John and the Bishop of Smyrna, was arrested for refusing to renounce his faith in Christ. 
When brought to the stadium to be burned alive, eyewitness accounts describe that the flames formed an arc around him and did not burn his body. It is said that a miraculous fragrance, like frankincense, filled the air. When the authorities realized that the fire would not consume him, they ordered an executioner to stab him with a sword, and only then did he die. Man. Man. And you're like, wait, why? Why was he saved so miraculously from the fire and then stabbed? Why, why wouldn't God save him from the stabbing? Because the point, the point of him being saved by the fire was not so that he could live longer. The point was so that other people would see it and go, oh my goodness, God is real. Wow. And then God was done with him. All right, cool, stab him. That's it. That's our, that's our life. It was, the point wasn't that, that he could then then, then start a new ministry, a, a, a revival ministry about not being burned by fire. It was all for the glory of God, and the vessel then it served no more purpose. God's like, all right, cool. You did what I wanted you to do, Polycarp. Let's, let's get you home, man. They're not going to let you go, so <laughs> let's get you out of here. It was not so that he could live longer. It was so that people would be talking about it thousands of years later. How about that? Man, this is suffering for the Christian. Suffering. The only time suffering is negative is when you believe the lie that your life is your own. It's not. It's not. It's for Jesus. The more you die, the more he is glorified. The more that you can identify with him. And these last two verses sum it up. Sum up what Paul is trying to tell, tell us. Always caring about in the, body of, in, in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. This is a constant thing for us Christians. Dying. Caring about in our, in our broken vessels the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's how people see it. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul says a very similar thing in a little bit more of a concise way in Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of his suffering being conformed to his death. Everyone wants to experience and identify the glorious resurrection part. That's awesome. But identifying with his death and burial, it's a a whole nother story. This is baptism. You go down into the grave and you, you rise up in the resurrection power of Jesus, signifying dying to yourself, dying to your sin, dying to your own desires. So that you can be raised out and the life of Christ may be manifested in your body. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But don't get it twisted. The cross that he's telling you to, to bear, to pick up, it's, it, it can't be compared. It's a, it's a light, it's a frail affliction. It's not equal to his affliction, No. We, we are fragile jars of clay because we deserve to be. We're fragile, these fragile earthen vessels because we, we chose sin. We chose to be it. But God, he, he became, he became a fragile jar of clay by, by his choice. By his choice. We're born into it. He, he, he chose. He didn't deserve to be. We couldn't help it. You're like, I would do it better if I was in the garden. No, you wouldn't. You would not. You would eat too of the fruit. You would fall too. You chose sin. He chose brokenness, even though he didn't have to. The Son of God chose to take on the frailty of humanity to identify with us in our broken, cracked state. He was, by choice, shattered and broken so that we don't have to be. So that we could be anti-fragile in receiving that light of the knowledge of the glory of God. He chose to be shattered and broken so that we didn't have to be. He was pressed, and in the place of pressing the garden of Gethsemane, and crushed so that we don't have to be. Jesus, the Son of God, was forsaken so that we don't have to be forsaken. He was resurrected from the dead so that we too could be. So that we could identify in that same way. I, don't have, I didn't have this in the notes, but it's so good. It, later on in this, in this passage, in 
Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing. Even though our outward man is perishing, the, the, the vessel is, is cracking, it's falling apart. It's falling apart. It's falling apart. Yet the inward man, what he's placed inside of me in, in the spirit is being renewed day by day. Every single day is getting stronger. Every single day my flesh, is, my flesh is disappearing, hopefully. The vessel is cracking away. I'm getting older. You, you're born to die. Everybody's gonna die. You're going to die. You immediately start the decaying process. You just have to get a little bit bigger first. And then you start, you continue on into death. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. For why our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. This vessel is temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The contents are are eternal. He was, he was forsaken so that we didn't have to be. The least we could do is to get into a jacuzzi. That's it. Like that, he's, like, he's like, hey, repent. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Get baptized. That's what he's asking us to do. Pick up your cross, but it's not the same affliction that he experienced. No. It's an affliction so that we might magnify the Lord and what he's done. In the pressing, he's glorified. In the suffering, he's magnified. In the perplexities, he is the only thing that makes sense. The only thing. In the persecution, he is the purpose. He brings purpose to all of it. In, in the death, he is the resurrection. In the death of life, in the death that we all will experience, he is the resurrection. Today, I, I'm inviting you today, if you haven't been baptized, to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection. To to identify just in the way that, that that balloon is filled with water, that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you would not be, that you would not be moved and crushed by the things of the world, all these, the pressing in around you, filled with the Holy Spirit, the water not just washing you clean, but the water symbolizing the Holy Spirit, filling you with so great a treasure. The only thing, the only thing that can fortify such a frail jar of clay the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Alex up and Sophie up as, as we begin to, to get ready for baptisms. And I'm going to pray. And then as I'm praying, if the Lord puts it on your heart to be baptized, you can walk up and, get, and line up over here and we'll, we'll, we'll baptize you. And if, when I open my eyes, there's no one over here, then we're just going to go home, okay? So I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you've given us the ability Lord, to, to, to be here today in this time, ordained by you. Lord, that you would, you would give us a, a courage in life to follow after you. You would give us a courage in life to glorify you in everything that we do. Lord, that you would, you would empower us in a way that, that I, we've never been empowered before. Lord, we give you our hearts. We, we continually empty ourselves. Lord, we empty ourselves of everything, Lord, that we might embrace the only thing that can fortify us from the inside out. Lord, we give you the glory. Lord, we give you all the praise. Lord, we thank you that you, you, you take our, our fragility and turn it into to absolute fortification in your spirit. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.